Okay, this is section two uh, of the Bird's Eye View handout um, on segments, not letters. Um, okay, so uh, we're studying speech sounds, right? That's what this class is about, at least at the beginning. Um, and uh, that last step in the speech chain where the air hits somebody's ear and you end up perceiving a sound, um, <clears throat> One of the things you get out of that step of perceiving sounds is a, a single linguistically relevant sound, and we're going to refer to those sounds as segments. These are basically the shortest recurring elements in a language, um, and we write these segments using the International Phonetic Alphabet. Right? So we're going to spend a lot of time uh, learning and using the IPA in this class. That's what the first several homework assignments are about. Um, and it's just a systematic way to write down sounds that might appear in different languages. Uh, so it works reasonably well for English. It should work reasonably well for other languages as well. Uh, that's why it's international. It's a universal standard that everybody who studies speech sounds has agreed <coughs> excuse me, that we're going to use uh, to represent sounds. Right? Uh, the IPA, this is where it gets confusing, uses letter characters that look a lot like writing systems, uh, in, in particular Roman writing systems. Uh, and these are uh, writing systems are referred to as orthography uh, in linguistics. Um, and so the IPA looks like orthography. It looks like English letters, looks like Spanish letters, looks like French letters. Um, and yeah, this is where the confusion starts, right? So the way you'd write the word, uh, for instance, bit in English is as shown on your handout here. First of all, we put brackets around phonetic transcriptions, transcriptions of sounds, so bracket. There's the English word bit, right? So it has uh, three segments in it. We call this one a voiced labial stop, b. This one is a high front unrounded lax vowel, i. And this last one is a voiceless coronal stop, t. B, i, t, bit. So this is how the IPA works. This word also happens to be written with three letters in normal uh, English writing. Uh, so if you're going to write this down, I would probably put it in quotes here just to show, hey, I'm using the English writing system here, not the IPA. Uh, you would spell it B-I-T. And obviously, these two things look like each other. Right? So I've got some other examples on the handout here. You can see the words hot and paper. Um, and they kind of look like you would spell those English words. This is going to be even more true in Spanish because the IPA system is much more similar to Spanish orthography than it is to English orthography. Uh, but it's going to be really important in this class uh, that to remember that we're studying sounds and not writing or reading. So there's no sense in which the word of spoken English, bit, has like three letters in it or something. Letters are not uh, a part of spoken language, and that distinction is important for reasons I'll get to shortly, right? Um, so we got to remember everything we're talking about in this class uh, is going to be about speech sounds, not about the way that they're written. And this can be very confusing because most of us have spent our entire lives learning to represent sound, at least indirectly, by using some kind of a writing system from our native language. And now I'm telling you, no, we got to ditch all that uh, English spelling, all that Spanish spelling, French spelling, Arabic spelling systems. We got to get rid of all of those. We're going to use IPA for this class, right? So the first question is, well, why can't we just use the spelling system we already know to write sounds instead of learning a whole new one? Um, and this one has a pretty straightforward answer that's most easily illustrated with English, right? Uh, and this is that unlike the IPA, orthographic, orthographic systems, that is writing systems, are not precise, coherent, or consistent, right? So it, for example, in English, uh, letters can sometimes correspond to a single sound. Um, so these examples like uh, the sounds b, i, and t are pretty well represented by the English letters b, i, and t. Um, so it works pretty well there. Uh, but sometimes uh, single letters in English writing don't. So for instance, uh, you can have one sound with more than one letter. Uh, sorry, there's one sound that's written with more than one letter. For instance, the initial sound in the English word shot 
uh, is represented with two letters here, an S and an H to make that SH sound. Nonetheless, that SH sound is a single sound. It's a voiceless post-alveolar affricate. It's going to be written with this kind of big loopy S in the IPA. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a case where the spelling system obscures more than it enlightens, right? Uh, because uh, the English sound SH does not consist of combining the English sounds S and H or anything like that. This is just an arbitrary convention that we have for spelling this sound, right? Uh, it's still a single speech sound. And I gave some other examples here. Um, so the vowel in beat uh, is going to be written as an I in IPA. In fact, this English spelling is how you would spell the word beat in IPA. It would look like this in square brackets, again, because we're talking about a phonetic transcription. Um, yet in English orthography, this vowel sound E requires two letters. In this particular case, it's going to be EA. Elsewhere in the language, it's spelled in a lot of different ways. It can be EE, -E, it can be IE. -E. There's all sorts of ways to spell vowel sounds in English. Uh, but if we're talking about the same vowel sound, it's always going to be written the same way in IPA. Uh, so that's the consistency we're talking about. Uh, we equally well uh, have some languages uh, where you get one letter that actually uh, it stands for more than one sound. Um, so the only obvious example I can think of in English um, is the letter X, uh, which often stands for two sounds, as in the word lax, written, written with a final S here, excuse me, a final X here. Uh, that final X is actually standing in for two separate speech sounds in English. There's a voiceless velar stop, K, and a voiceless alveolar affricate, S, right? So this is actually two different speech sounds, happens to be written with one letter in English. Uh, more generally, you get lots of letters or strings of letters, or more than one letter, that uh, map to different sounds depending on which word they're appearing in in English. So the example here um, is with, uh, we would call this a digraph, a sequence of two letters, SC in the English writing system that can uh, stand for all kinds of different sounds depending on which word it appears in. Uh, so the examples here are uh, the English word science begins with an SC and there it just stands for a S sound. That's again this voiceless alveolar fricative. Uh, in the word disc you get that SC digraph at the end of it. There it stands for two different sounds. It's a voiceless alveolar fricative followed by a voiceless velar stop, ska, s, ka, right? Uh, and then in the word fascist here, uh, you get that sc digraph in the middle of the word, uh, and it stands for the voiceless post-alveolar, uh, excuse me, fricative, sh, right? So uh, this sc digraph doesn't have a consistent sound in English. It can mean uh, different sounds in different words where it appears. Uh, in the IPA, these three sounds are all going to be written differently uh, because they're all different sounds. So again, it's going to be completely coherent and consistent in the IPA system. Right? Uh, English in particular has lots of letters. Anybody who's learned English as a foreign language knows that the writing system of English is particularly ugly and impossible. Um, and so I'm going to go through some more English examples here. Uh, but all of these things are true, even if to a lesser extent, in other languages, right? Um, just not as much as in English. So in English, uh, some letters don't make any sound at all. This is pretty common. So these final E sound uh, letters in particular um, often uh, are not making any sounds themselves, but they're changing the way we interpret some earlier vowel sound. Um, so for instance, in the word late, uh, what that final E is telling you is that the preceding A letter should be pronounced A. Uh, if that E weren't there, we'd probably pronounce it as an A, ah, right? Similarly, the final E's in bite and cute um, are <coughs> uh, not actually making any contribution or any sounds on their own. They're not representing a final vowel in the word. They're just telling us something about the way the other sounds in the word ought to be interpreted, right? So this is a pretty complex and not optimal system uh, for describing the sounds even of English, much less of other languages. Um, and then of course, this being English, some spellings are just nonsense, right? So some examples here, night, 
right? Spelled with an initial K-N and then this I-G-H-T ending that is somehow supposed to sound like it. Um, the word tough, where, which has this vowel digraph, O-U, which is somehow representing the vowel sound uh, and then I guess G-H is supposed to be F here, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and then the word air, where, uh, I mean, this doesn't even look like an English spelling of any other word I know. We don't get a lot of E-I digraphs in English. This one is pronounced uh, with an A, and then that initial H is just completely unpronounced. You don't, it doesn't make any sound at all. Um, so these words are completely uh, nonsensical spellings. This is not how any English-speaking child would ever guess that they should spell these words. Um, all of these actually probably have uh, alternate spellings that people have adapted that make more sense. Um, and the point here uh, is, well, a lot of stuff in English spelling doesn't make any sense. So we're just not going to use it. We're going to use an alphabet that's consistent and coherent and can represent more detail. I'll get to that in a second. Um, there's a question here, just as an aside, some people find this interesting. How do you think things got this way in English? How could this ever have become a spelling of the word night, right? Um, give yourself a second, see if you can answer that, at least in broad outline. You don't need all the details. Okay, well, here's the answer. Um, all of these bizarre spellings, or most of them in English, reflect earlier stages of linguistic history uh, when these spellings would have made more sense phonetically. So in particular, and I'm sort of guessing for this particular word, I don't know the exact history of this word, but all of these general things are things that happened in the history of English. Um, so here's what I would say about this word. It's very, very likely that at some point this came from late Proto-Germanic or something like that. Maybe it was uh, early, uh, early English or early uh, yeah, Angles speech. Um, where almost surely these two sounds would have both been pronounced here, kna. Right? So this is a pretty common uh, word initial sequence in Germanic languages. You can still find lots of words in German that begin with kna, and English retains some of the spelling of some of those super old words that have been in, in our language for 800 years, even though we stop pronouncing this k maybe 500 years ago, it's still in the spelling because of accidents of history. Uh, similarly, originally, this digraph uh, GH, this probably represented some kind of a fricative like xia. This could have been something like knicht or something like that. Uh, might have been the way this was pronounced in early English. And of course, over time, English lost these palatal and velar fricatives like xia and kha. Uh, so that they don't exist in modern English. They do still exist in German, again. Uh, but even though those sounds left the language, the spellings remain traditional. So when this spelling entered the language, it probably made sense. It was probably k, n, short vowel e, uh, and then a fricative and a ta. That's probably what this word sounded like at some long lost stage of English, well before a, any of our uh, grandparents or William Shakespeare even were born. Right? That might have been what this sounded like. Of course, nowadays, it hasn't been pronounced like this for 700 years, uh, but we still use these traditional spellings uh, because spelling apparently is an easier to pass on system than phonology. Uh, but the result is that this really doesn't make any sense as a way of spelling a word in modern English, but we're powerless to change it. Right? Nobody has managed to change this spelling um, for however many hundreds of years it's been in the language. Great example of why we would never use English spelling uh, to talk about the uh, sound structure of English. Okay, so that was my aside. Um, of course, English is a very extreme case. This is not how most languages writing systems work for languages that have writing systems. Right? Uh, most orthographies are going to be a fair bit more consistent than the English one. Um, but that said, even very consistent orthographies, uh, like Spanish, for instance, we have a number of Spanish speakers in this class, and the Spanish spelling system is everything that the English one isn't. It's a delight to use. It's incredibly easy to learn. It has an almost one-to-one -one correspondence between sounds and letters, though not quite. 
Um, and yeah, it, it's sort of uh, very consistent as orthographies go. Um, and in fact, the IPA for basic sounds, um, at least the ones that are in Spanish, looks a lot like Spanish orthography. Um, but that said, uh, even these very consistent orthographies like Spanish will ignore phonetic details that we need to capture in this class. So I have some examples from Spanish here. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce some Spanish words. I'm not very good at this, but uh, you'll get hopefully the basic idea here. Um, so actually this first example uh, I'm going to be super bad at because I cannot produce the trill sound uh, that occurs in Spanish and many other languages, so I'm going to have to fake it. Uh, that initial R sound in uh, <coughs> this word broken in Spanish um, is a trill. It's the kind of thing you can hear uh, in many languages, in Russian, in Spanish, um, and you can look this up on the, uh, the course website in, in the sound, uh, uh, a course in phonetics link on, the, on our course website. You'll see an interactive IPA chart. It has lots of examples of these sounds in all kinds of different languages. Um, so this is going to be something like roto, but where I didn't pronounce that trill properly because I can't. Uh, and that's the R, the R letter at the beginning of that word. You put that same letter um, in the middle of a word, as in the word for bull here, and it makes a different sound. It's a tap sound or flap sound. Right? So as in Toro. So two different sounds in those two different contexts. Um, and uh, this difference is relevant to Spanish phonology, but not represented in the orthography. Um, so if you wanted to put a trill in that uh, word for bull, you'd have to use a different uh, way of writing it in Spanish. Here's another example from Spanish. Um, the B sound in the word bien, which means well, right, is going to be a, a voiced labial stop, but um, and that's going to be very different from the B letter in the sequence of words very well. Muy bien. That one is not a stop at all. Um, it's going to be probably some kind of an approximant or a continuant consonant. I've written it here as a fricative. Ua. Uh, not clear that that's exactly what it's like, but in any case, it's going to be a very different sound than the one at the beginning of bien. But you can't write this distinction in Spanish. So we do still need IPA, even in languages that have fairly consistent and regular orthographies. Um, there's a second question that sometimes comes up here, which is, well, why do we have to study sounds instead of writing? I'm interested in writing. Right? I want to study writing systems, which is completely fine. And linguists do sometimes study writing systems. <coughs> but it's important to understand that language is basic and writing systems are derived from linguistic systems. Uh, they're technologies that get created to represent linguistic systems. So if you want to understand how some writing system works, you're going to first need to know something about the language that it's meant to represent, and in particular, the sound system of that language. Um, so it would be pretty useless to try to figure out why English spelling is weird without knowing the history of English phonetics and phonology. If you don't know that English is related to other Germanic languages and that it used to have velar fricatives but no longer does, you're never going to figure out why this writing system works the way it does. It's not going to be clear at all. Right? You need to know something about the phonetics and the phonology of the language before you can understand its writing system. And this is going to be equally true for other writing systems, right? It would be totally useless to try to figure out why Semitic orthographies, as in Arabic or Hebrew, uh, use the main characters, the main letters in their alphabets, only to represent consonants, and usually don't write their vowels at all. Uh, how are you going to figure that out? Well, you need to know something about morphology, that is word formation, in Semitic languages in order to understand why that makes sense as a strategy for representing Arabic or representing Hebrew, it's because of the way that word formation works. Right? If you don't know anything about the linguistic system, you're not going to figure out anything interesting about the writing system. And it would be just as useless trying to figure out why Chinese writing uses characters that mostly represent one-syllable sequences. That is, sequences of sounds that are usually a consonant and a vowel, maybe a consonant, a vowel, and another consonant in rare cases. Um, and that's true of almost every character 
uh, in Chinese writing systems. Um, and you're never going to understand why it works that way if you don't understand how the lexicon and the morphology and words work in Chinese. Right? You're not going to get any explanation of why they mostly represent a single syllable without knowing something about how those syllables function in the language. The answer is basically every morpheme in Sinitic languages, uh, those related to, Ch to Chinese, uh, is a single syllable. Right? So more generally, um, linguists sometimes study writing systems, though uh, much more often they're focused on spoken language. Um, so why do we focus on sound and not writing? Well, it's because linguistic sound is basic, is universal, and is part of our biological human endowment. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, reliably, every human being born anywhere in the world uh, as far as we know, for the entire history of our species, has naturally acquired a language without uh, needing any kind of explicit teaching or anything else, just by being around that language. If you leave an infant in a place where people are speaking some language, they will acquire that language, right? unless there's something uh, medically or pathologically wrong with them. Um, it also appears to be universal to all human cultures at all times in human history. Um, and it's part of our biological endowment in the sense that uh, we know that the human uh, brain and the human vocal tract uh, have gone through certain kinds of evolutionary changes that arguably have made it possible to speak and hear a language. Now, that's a little bit more controversial, um, but... Uh, it seems pretty clear that young infants come out of the womb ready to learn speech sounds. The same is absolutely not true of writing systems. Writing systems are a technology, right? Just like uh, harnessing electricity, making computers, uh, or developing a wheel, right? A writing system is a technology for representing a linguistic system. Uh, they arise only rarely in human history. There's a handful of independent inventions of written language. I don't know the exact number, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 uh, completely independent uh, writing systems developed in the history of human beings. Um, and as opposed to like, you know, hundreds and thousands of languages, uh, there are, even in the modern world, there are millions of people uh, who speak a language completely natively and normally without knowing any writing system for representing it at all. Um, so lots and lots of people speak languages despite not being able to read or write in those languages, whereas, uh, <clears throat> yeah. and that includes many languages in the world that simply don't have a writing system because nobody ever invented one or nobody's adapted one to that language. So this is true even now. You go back even a couple hundred years and almost everybody on earth didn't know how to read or write in any language. Yet they didn't seem to have any trouble learning and representing and passing on those languages. And that's why we think language is basic and writing is derived. So if the job of the linguist is to study what human languages are like, uh, we're going to miss tons of interesting stuff by focusing on writing, because very few languages even had writing systems until the 20th century. Most of the languages in the history of the world were not written at all. And many of the languages spoken in the world today have no formal writing system. Uh, but sound is basic, writing is derived, and if we want to learn about the basics of human language, we need to learn about the sound part first. So that's what this class is about.